Some years ago, a friend of mine, um, he bought a new house and the house, the yard for the house that he purchased was like really, really steep, like almost straight up and down. And so he had a regular push mower. He, he's like, I'm gonna go get an upgrade. So he went in and said, what's the, what's the best mower? I can't do a riding mower because it's too steep. What's the best mower you have? Um, and they said, this is the one. It, it was like a $600 mower. And he was like, well, that's really expensive. And you know, but you know, the, this, is, this is the best one we got. So, so he got it and he went to his house and, and he was mowing it. They said, this will make it so much easier for you. He's mowing the lawn, mowing the lawn. And he's pushing and he's like, this is not easier. This is harder. This makes no sense. Like, why is this twice as hard for me to use this push mower than any push mower I've ever used before? And he's continuing to go and continuing to go. And, and finally, one of the workers on his house that was doing some finishing touches went over there and he pushed the lever and he turned on the self-propel part of the mower. So in other words, he was pushing the mower that had a self-propelled function on it, but he didn't know it had a self-propelled function on it. So he was trying to push it himself when it had the power to help him do what he was trying to do. Can I just tell y'all we live life that way sometimes? All he had to do to change his experience was change his settings. And that's what I'm gonna talk to you this morning about on the topic of change your settings. Say it with me, say change your settings. In other words, he had the capacity to make it easier, but he didn't operate in it because he didn't understand it and he didn't change the settings. Uh, even, even the other day, this was maybe two or three days ago, um, I had turned my, my phone dim the night before when I, and I was laying, sadly, I was laying in bed looking at my phone and you shouldn't, anybody ever dropped it and hit yourself in the face when you're looking at your phone? So uh, way too many times that I care to even tell y'all, but so I'm doing that and, and I, I dim my, my light, my brightness a lot so I, you know, it's not hurting my eyes. Well, the next day I forgot I had dimmed it and I'm like going about my day and I'm looking, I'm like, I can't see. I'm like, this is what 40 is honestly like. Like, like I can't see, my back is hurting right now. Like, Lord, this is it. Like, what's going on? And, uh, and I finally realized like, wait a minute. So I went into the settings and I turned the brightness back up. And I just want to tell you that whether you know it or not, we all have settings. We all have settings. It's our attitude is a setting that we have inside of us. Our worldview is a setting that we have inside of us. Our, our personality is a setting that we have. And, and there's all of these things that we have. And if we're not careful, we say the most dangerous words that are in the human vocabulary. That's just the way I am. Those, those are dangerous, toxic words. That's just the way I am. And, and what we do is we, we excuse toxic behavior and we just say, that's just the way I am. You ever met somebody that's just rude and they say, well, that's just the way I am. Or, or they're a jerk and that's just the way I am. Not, no, no, that's the way you choose to continue to be. But because of Jesus, he's given us the ability to change our settings. And so we're going to talk about that today. If you're really getting down to bullet down to the simplicity of what we're saying, we're talking about transformation. And I want to bring your attention to the gospel of John chapter five, beginning in verse number one. I feel like we have a story here where we can expound on this and the Lord can unpack in a way that's applicable for us, but also illustrated for us in the story of this man, something that I believe he wants to do in all of us today. John chapter five, beginning in verse one says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there in Jerusalem by the sheep gate uh, was a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda. Bethesda means house of mercy, by the way. And it says having five porches, in these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. Leave it to a couple of religious folks to ruin a rejoicing moment in the Lord. It says he answered them, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, who is the man who said this to you? Take up your bed and walk. But the one who was healed did not know who it was for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. 
Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Let us pray, but also let us remember that snitches get stitches. And that's what this guy just did on Jesus. So let's pray. Jesus, I love you so much. Thank you for how good and kind you are. I ask that you help me to preach today in a way that's clear and compelling. Let it be impactful, enjoyable, Lord. But most of all, let it be transformational. If I say anything that's not of you, guard the people's hearts. But if what I say is from you, let it find good ground to bring forth the kingdom harvest in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen, amen and amen. So this is this incredible story that I believe illustrates what so many of us face at times. And, and there's just various aspects of this that I want to unpack when it comes to transformation in our life and, and really changing really who we are. And this, this is what I want you to get. And I want to kind of lay this from the, the foundation from the beginning is we live in, in a culture that, that we've, we've misunderstood accepting a person with accepting sickness and toxic traits. In other words, I can accept you as a person and not be okay with toxic traits you may have. I, I can love my family. I can love my, my, my uncle, uh, and I'm just going to say uncle Jimmy Joe. I don't have uncle Jimmy Joe, so nobody can be offended. And, but I love him, but if he is violent or vile and all of that, I can love him as a person, but that doesn't excuse his behavior. And I fear what we have done is we have cornered people to think that for you to accept me, then you have to be willing to embrace my toxic behavior. But can I tell you, there's a thing called boundaries that we can put up with people. And that's healthy and it is needed for us to function as a society, as a family, and as a healthy and whole individual. Boundaries are essential and boundaries are important. But we also see in this story that we can relate to this story because this man is, is at Bethesda. Bethesda is known as the house of mercy. And there was five porches and it's mentioned, I believe on purpose, five is a number of grace. So literally this man is at the place of mercy and grace, but yet he's in this place and he has not found his healing. And can I tell you this morning this, that you're here this morning and you're at the right place. You're at a place of mercy and you're at a house of grace. Like the, the church should always be a house of mercy and a house of grace. The church should always be the place. Notice in this place, this house of mercy was where the sick individuals were gathering because there was an expectation that God or one of his holy angels were gonna come down, stir the water, and that they would find healing in that place. I believe the only reason that broken, sick, and, and sick individuals come into this place is they come believing that God is going to stir the waters and something will happen in this place and they can find healing. Can I tell you that we don't have to wait for a pool to be stirred because a cross was already hung on and a tomb is already empty. And because of that, the Holy Spirit has already been poured out. And that means that we have access to everything that Jesus paid for. The promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus. If you're grateful for that, can we say amen? But also this, we need to know this is a place anyone can come. Anyone can come, no matter what your dysfunction, no matter what your brokenness, you can come to this place and we will love you. And this is the thing, we will accept you, but it doesn't mean we will have to accept the toxic behavior. We can love you and be honest with you. We can love you and encourage you to walk in the truth. We can love you and tell you that the decisions you're making are destructive. And what we can't do is say that if you tell me something I don't like, it means you don't love me. Because then love is not love. Love is manipulation. And love is used as leverage. And love is used to keep people hostage to your opinion and your way of life. That's not love. That's manipulative. It's manipulative, it's manipulation, it's, it's, it's holding people hostage to make them feel like if they don't accept what you want them to accept, then you hate them or you don't care about them. But in reality, love demands truth. So we see that this is happening in this story, but, but we also see that this man was there and he wasn't healed. And, and, he, and he was there and he was there for a long time and it denotes he was there for an extended time. He had been sick 38 years in this condition can I tell you that, that you can even be in the house of mercy and not find your healing? That, that you could sit on a chair in this church for 38 years and not be healed. That you can sit on a chair in this church for 38 years and not be saved. 
Because it's not just about being in the atmosphere, it's about how we respond by faith to Jesus in this atmosphere. Like, like am I gonna come and enjoy or am I gonna come and engage? Am I just gonna enjoy the service or am I gonna worship Jesus? Am I just gonna go through the motions or am I gonna have faith to believe that God's gonna do something in my life? Am I gonna have the humility to say, God, I need you in this moment and I'm asking you to meet me in the midst of my mess? The good news I have for you is this. It's in this story, the angel healed by people's merit. But, but that's not how God heals. Jesus went to the last one. Now, notice that in this story, the angel would stir the waters and whoever got in first was who got healed. It was a race. And, and think about that. That makes us feel at times, if we're not careful, like I have to earn his healing. I have to earn his favor. But, but yet Jesus didn't go to the one that was in the pool. Jesus didn't go to the one that could get there. Jesus went to the one that failed year after year after year after year and said, I've got something for you. Can I tell you the good news is this? Is Jesus didn't just come to the one that always gets it right, to the one that's first in line. Jesus came to the one that's here at Gateway Church today that always fails time after time after time and he says I've got something better for you I want to make you whole that's Jesus he wants to heal us he wants to make us whole that's the beauty of grace is we can't earn it we don't deserve it but yet he gives it to us and he lavishes us with his love and with his grace and with his mercy but then it comes to a point in that atmosphere where Jesus asks a question that I believe is a question that he's asking to us today, but I would also offer, I believe this is perhaps one of the greatest questions he's asking a generation of people right now. And the question was the first words of Jesus in this story. When he sees this man, he looks at him and he says to him in verse six, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? And you may think that's a crazy question. I thought the same thing till a few years ago. I was praying with someone right here in this altar. And I was praying for him, and, and I knew this, this, this brother had back condition, a really severe back condition. And, and I went to him, and I said, I feel like the Lord's going to heal you. I, I just, it was like faith, gift of faith rose up in my heart. I don't, use, I don't always say it that way. I just, I feel like the Lord wants to heal you. And I went to pray, and he says, well, could you, could you pray after next week? I have my disability hearing next week. <laughs> Amen. That's what I was doing inside too, brother. When I heard, I was like, what? Like, like seriously, like, like he did not want to be healed. And, I, and, and so I, there are people that if we're not careful, there is an addiction to our affliction that we begin to identify with the dysfunction in our life. And it becomes something that we wear as a badge and as a label. And if we're not careful, we use it as a crutch to inexcuse our lack of responsibility to be the person that God has called us to become. So, so, so this is the thing is, is we will take woundedness and use it as an excuse for toxic behavior in our own life. So, so the first thing I'm going to ask you this morning is the most important thing that I'm asking you in the context of this message. And it's, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be healed and whole? Do you want to be a whole person? Do you want him to heal your heart? Do you want to be a healthy uh, husband? Do you want to be a healthy wife? Do you want to be a healthy parent? Do you, do you want to become everything God's calling you to become? Because if you do, God will let you change your settings. But the challenge is this. So many people sabotage their own success. Some people, again, they're addicted to their affliction. Their, their comfort is their chains and their bondage. And they don't know how to operate outside of it. And the Bible warns as a dog returns to its vomit, so people return back to their sinful ways. And, and it's a challenge for us. And, and for us, I think we have to really get honest with ourselves to, to say, am I really truly sincere about finding freedom? You know, the thing about it is this, is I, I fear that what we've done is we've normalized bondage. We've normalized being broken. And we've normalized the toxic behavior. And, and what I'm saying is, I'm not saying we need to have shame and, and guilt people and put people down if they're struggling. I'm not saying there's not seasons that you walk through brokenness. Lord, I have walked through more brokenness than I even care to talk about this morning. But can I tell you, I, I was broken, but I didn't stay broken. 
Like, like I, I chose to let the Lord heal me and chose to, to get up and move forward. And, and I chose, there, there's lots of times that I could have, I could have started the blame game. And, that, and that's what happens in this story. And this is what happens in our heart if we're not careful is, is, is we get so caught up in normalizing our bondage and, and our, 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 our brokenness that we start blaming other people instead of taking ownership ourselves. I could blame everyone that's ever hurt me. I could blame every. Listen, I could sit here and if I, if, I, if I talk through this with you, I could tell you all the things that's happened in my life and you would be like, I can see the point of why he would never trust anyone. I understand that. I've been betrayed. I've been stabbed in the back. I, I've been, there's all, I, go, I can go down the list of my life. Abuse, all of it, okay? Trauma, there. And I could tell you all of that and you'd be like, yeah, that, but, but the Lord says, I didn't go to the cross and I didn't pay the price that I paid. I didn't take stripes on my back so that my children could stay bound and broken and what they're facing and going through. But I came to give you real lasting freedom. And so, so for me, I, I, I wanted to say like, like quit blaming people. Like, like I get it and I understand it. And I just want to say like, I, I started therapy a few years ago and it was the, the best things I ever did just to have somebody to talk to. I can sit down and I can say whatever I want to say and they're not going to leave the church. And I just, I'm like, this is, this is how I'm feeling about this. And I need to get this off my chest. And, and, and this is how I feel. Da, 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 da. And, and, and by the end of it, I'm like, that was really, that was illogical. I don't know why I was feeling that way. Now that I talk about it and get, you ever say something, you feel something. And then when you actually say it to somebody else, you realize how stupid it is. How it's coming out your mouth. Like, like I said, I was like, this is how I feel. It's pretty stupid, isn't it? <laughs> like, you know? Like, like it was, it made no sense why I felt that way. And to be able to process it is so important. But I remember when I first started talking to my therapist, I, my psychologist, I, I, I laid down on the couch and I was like, so this is where I lay on a couch and I tell you how bad my parents were, right? I talk about everything they did to make me this way. And she, she kind of laughed because isn't that kind of the idea we get of, well, my mom this and my dad this and this. And I have great parents, by the way, but like amazing. I couldn't ask for better. But, but it seems like, I just want to tell you, if you're looking for something they did that was a shortcoming and using that as a reason to enable your actions, you will always be able to find something. Because this is, listen, this is what I found. You'll find people do this. Some will say, my parents deprived me. Like, I, I didn't get anything handed to me that made me have to earn everything myself. I, I, I never, ever, like, they weren't very affectionate and all this stuff. And then you hear another one go, well, my parents spoiled me. That's why I don't have a great work ethic now. And, and they did everything for me. And they, they loved me and they nurtured me. I was way too sheltered. Like, so, like, as a parent, I remember hearing these different stories because they come into my office. And I'm not a therapist, but people thought I was a therapist. And people discovered really quick, Pastor Jason's not great at counseling. Because they would be like, this is what I'm doing. I'd be like, well, stop doing that. Don't do that. <laughs> I'll bill you. <laughs> so, and so, but it was like, it was like they would say this and that. And so as a parent, I'm thinking, okay, I need to love them this much, but not too much. And, and I need to support them, but not too much. And, and like, it's this thing. But even in that, they can have the perspective that what I did wasn't enough. What I'm trying to say is I may even be to the extreme. Like your dad may still be looking for that gallon of milk. And if he is, I'm so sorry. And that you went through that. He may have abandoned you and your family. But can I tell you, you have to get to the point in your life. And I'm so sorry you went through that. And I empathize. I have compassion for you, but you got to get to the point in life that you don't allow their mistake to cause you to make your mistakes. What, what, what I mean by that is you can, listen, what we, we will never escape the things that we excuse. And, and if we say, well, my dad wasn't there and he wasn't a good dad, so I'm not a good dad. Change the trajectory of the generations in your family. Be like, he may not have been, but I'm going to be the dad that I wish he could have been. Your mom may have been a refrigerator mom and not affectionate to you. And you may say, well, that hurts me deeply and I don't have the capacity. It's uncomfortable for me to show affection. But guess what? Your baby girl and your baby boy and your husband or whoever needs the affection that you're supposed to give them as a nurturing person in the home. So don't say, I didn't. Say, I'm starting a new trend. I'm changing my settings. It may be cold. It may be isolated. It may be rude. But I'm changing 
changing it to kind. I'm changing it to loving. I'm going to be like Jesus for my family. I'm going to be like Jesus for my friends. And I'm going to give glory to God for how I live my life. We have the, you know, self-control is fruit of the Holy Spirit. Self-control, that, that means the people that said stuff about you don't control you. It means the people that hurt you don't control you. Like, you have the ability to choose the kind of person you're going to be. So that means we have to stop blaming everybody else. You know, it's easy. And it goes all the way back to Genesis. To be honest, it's the first default thing we did when we did something wrong. Like, think about it. Adam and Eve sin in the garden. God shows up. What does Adam say? She did it. <laughs> what does she say? The devil made me do it. So like, like blame is like in our DNA, but we get to change our settings. I, I, I pray that we get radical ownership. That we say, I'm gonna take ownership for who I am as a person. I'm gonna take ownership for my attitude. I'm gonna take ownership for my personality. I'm gonna take ownership for, for how I treat people. I'm gonna take ownership for the culture in my home. Like, like what if we took radical ownership instead of allowing the accumulation of the scars and the wounds over our life to set the trajectory of our life? It's not my scars that define me, it's his scars that define me. And when he took the scars on him, he brought healing into me and into you. If you're grateful for that, would you give him praise today? So let me ask you, like, what's, what's the excuses you're making? The, 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 some excuses. I, I, somebody hurt me. I don't feel loved enough. I don't feel connected. I feel looked over. I don't feel like God has given me the life I want. I wasn't born at the right time. I wasn't born in the right socioeconomic environment. I was born into a poor family. I was born the wrong gender. I was born the wrong race. I was born uh, it, it, with the wrong kind of people around me. Maybe it's some real hurt. Maybe, maybe your mom wasn't healed. Maybe your dad died too soon. I don't know what it is, but I know this. God will help you overcome whatever limitation you have to be the person he is calling you to be. But to do that, we cannot and we must not allow yesterday's pain to keep us from today's purpose and today's promises that Jesus has for us. We got to let go of that. So it comes down to this question like, like, do we actually want it bad enough? Do we want it bad enough? Because if we want it bad enough, it means that we have to face the things that Jesus has to heal. And it's not always easy to face the things that Jesus has to heal. I remember some years ago, I had this issue, it, it, was, it was an insecurity issue. It still crops up at times and still, you know. A anybody ever dealt with insecurity? Anybody too insecure to admit it? <laughs> like, like, like insecurity is a real thing. And, and, and you say, well, why did you grow up insecure? I, I grew up insecure for multiple reasons. And, and, and I'll get to those in just a second. But like, I, I noticed it because when I would go into a room, I was always hyper aware to read the room. And this is where the Lord turned my weakness into a superpower. Because if you can read a room, you can lead a room. So I'm hyper aware of the room, hyper aware of people's emotional state, hyper aware of the interaction and, and all of that. And you say, why? And, and it's like, when I walk in a room, it's like you've seen the math formulas like going in the head. That's, that's me in a room. And I don't mean to be that way. It's just like my antenna's up. Well, why does my antenna? Because I learned to microanalyze because of the wounds in my heart and my life. And the reason I, I did that is, is, is I would go in, I didn't want to be embarrassed because I'd been embarrassed before. And I, I went in a room and if I heard people laughing, I would be suspicious that they're talking about me. What did I do? Is my zipper up? Like, you know, that's the kind of things you start thinking. Like, why are they laughing? Is there something wrong? And, uh, and you say, well, where'd that come from? It came from PE, my gym class, coach Eric Smith, great man. And we were doing jumping jacks. And he said, Jason, I want you to come to the front. And I want you to demonstrate to the rest of the room how we're going to do jumping jacks. I was like, all right, coach, let's do this. Had my mullet. I was ready to go up there. Let's do this. And so I jump. I get up there. And, and I go. And I, I'm doing it. He's like, that's great for him. Like, Thanks, coach. And I'm doing it. And then all of a sudden, my sweatpants hit my ankles. I miss <laughs> That's exactly what I heard in the entire gym, Mike. <laughs> and so like it hit the, hit the ground and, and I'm there, little Jason with a mullet and my whitey tidies on. I mean, it was, and I froze. You would think I'd be like, oh, I didn't. I just stood there like a, like a deer in headlights. And, 
and it, it scarred me so much that I'm now a 41 year old man standing on a stage in a different state, in a different season of life, telling you about this horrible, isn't it God so God that would put me in a position that for my career, I'm standing on a stage in front of people all the time. But I want you to know I have a really good belt on right now. I have the belt of truth. And the, and so, but you think, well, that's so stupid. That was just that one incident as a child and everybody in this room, every adult in this room, whether you know it or not, inside you're a child. You're still that little boy or that little girl. That's the, that's the inner voice and the inner dialogue that we have. And that's why I believe Jesus said you have faith like a child. I think he wants us to tap in to that innocence and tap into that, 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 that belief in, in our father that when I was a kid, I would jump out and let, I believe my dad would save me from anything. And, but, and that's the kind of faith we should have in our heavenly father, that kind of radical faith that says, God, I trust you. But what happens over life that's why Jesus said it's better to tie a millstone around your neck and cast it into the sea than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Because when we hurt these little ones, they become the big ones one day. And they become wounded adults. And those wounded adults hurt people, hurt people. But the good news is heal people, heal people. And so the Lord sees us and he sees, listen, I, I say that all joking, but, but there's things you probably endure, things that happened to you, a rejection moment, a moment you felt forsaken, a moment you felt ignored, uh, any middle children in here, any middle children, like I, I, I see you, it's the first time you've ever been seen right now, but I see you. Like you feel ignored as a middle child, like, like anybody with blended families, like it's a challenge at times. Like I, I saw that I was in a blended family growing up. And, and so for us to understand there are things that impact us that influence how we act today, we have to recognize that we have to trace it. What's the root of this? But I found God says, if we will trace it, he will grace it that he reveals what he wants to heal. He doesn't reveal it to shame us. He reveals it to want to heal us. So, so in other words, he wants us to say, God, I'm humble enough to recognize the brokenness in my own heart and why I act this way. And so Lord, I'm asking you to help me and to make a life-giving choice to know that I don't have to protect myself anymore because you're protecting me. Most of the toxic behavior we have is self-defense. It's a coping mechanism. It's something we learn to do. It's, it's something that we learn to put walls up. The, the, the reason that many of us destroy relationships is we destroy relationships because we want to destroy it before they hurt us. That, that's, that's a thing that happens. See it all the time. Uh, some people, it's, it's you never let your guard down. You never love. Some of you, you love bomb, and all you do is you, you go overboard because you don't feel enough, and you're trying to, to get your worth, and you're trying to somehow make them feel like you're valid or, or that you're, you're worthy to be loved. Can I just tell y'all you're worthy? Can I, I just want to tell you, I'm thankful for you. You are an amazing church, but, but you as individuals, you are worthy, and you are loved, and you are valuable. Like You don't have to earn worth with somebody. You are worthy when you show up because Jesus paid the immense price for you. And when you determine the worth of something, you look at the price that was paid for it. And you guys received the greatest payment in the history of humanity and all of creation. And you are worthy. Can you thank God that you're worthy today? So what excuses are we making? What's the excuse you're making? Are, are, are you, are you saying, well, that's how, again, the worst thing you're going to say is that's just the way I am. That's just the way I am. And, and, and I heard that so many times. I had family members that would say that. And, and again, they're just rude people. And they would say, well, that's just the way I am. You can, you can like it or you can lump it. You can, you can get over it or you can accept me. No, 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 no. That's a bad way to think. We want to become everything that God has called us and created us to be. But we also want to bear fruit of the Holy Spirit. And if we have the Holy Spirit living in us, we'll look in Galatians and we'll see what the fruit of the Holy Spirit looks like. And that's the kind of life we should be living. And if we are not, that is a symptom to ask Jesus, why am I having trouble bearing and producing the fruit that your spirit is trying to generate in and through my life? Because it's a warning flag that something is not right. You're not just irritable. Maybe you need healing. You're not just rude. Maybe you need wholeness. You're not just a jerk. Maybe you need to forgive somebody. Maybe there's something the Lord needs to do in your heart and in your life. So my question again is, do you want it bad enough? Do you want to, do you want to be whole bad enough? Do you want to change the trajectory of generations bad enough? Do you want to write a new narrative about your life bad enough? 
because I'm thinking about this man in this story and he was there for 38 years. And I believe the reason Jesus asked him, do you really want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? Do you really? You sure about that? Like, I believe that's why he's asking him for this reason. It's because he had to get his self-determination in his heart to want the healing. And then Jesus says, then get up. Because I'm sorry, if I was there for 38 years, I would have found, I would have stayed in the water from one year to the next. I would have been pruny, but I would have been healed. Like I would have stayed there and not got out. Be like, no, I'd have just been floating me and my lame self there the whole time. Feed me, as I would be shouting from the pool. I would have found a way, I would have wiggled my way to get there. But this man shows that at first it didn't seem he was that hungry for it, he just was blaming other people. And that's the thing I feel like the Lord is saying is, is take radical ownership and do you want it bad enough to move outside of your identity being connected to your infirmity? Because survival is not enough. This man was living, but he was, he was alive, but he wasn't living. He was breathing, but he wasn't living life. And, and my prayer for you today is that you're not just existing, but that you're living that you're producing fruit in your life, that you're, you're living a life of purpose, that you have joy, that you get to experience love and you get to experience community because that's what the Lord wants for you. In this story, the man was waiting on an angel to come down, but Jesus was waiting on the man to get up. And, and this is what I believe this shows us in the story is Jesus told the man to get up. Is, is, is he didn't like lay hands or do any other extravagant. He just told him to get up. And I think for us, we can have that to see that faith is a verb. And there's often times that God tells us to do something. There's times that if I truly believe, I'm going to act on it. If I believe that, that, that he loves me and has set me free, I'm going to do something. I'm going to make a move based on the knowledge of what I have and who he is. This is what James says. James says, faith without works is dead. He said, he said that I will prove to you my faith by my works. In other words, works don't save us, but if you have faith, faith will always produce righteous actions. It is, it is faith is a verb. It's pistis in the Greek, and it means that we act upon it. When we really believe, if we believe what God's word says, listen, if we believe that there is an eternal place called hell, an eternal place called heaven, and everyone is going to spend uh, eternity in one of those two places, then you could not shut us up about the gospel if we truly believe it, because faith will drive us to action. If I truly believe that Jesus is my healer, then prayer will be my first step, not my last resort, because faith promotes action. And I just want to encourage you that whatever God is calling you into will demand you make a move on your part. And that may be, I have to choose to act a different way than I've always acted based on a choice I'm making right now. Even though I don't feel it, even though I don't want to do it, I'm choosing to change my settings, to change my internal hardwiring by faith in Christ and watch the Holy Spirit meet you in that moment and start transforming you into becoming more like Jesus. That's how transformation takes place. So I would say this, make a move, make a move. I'm going to close with this and this is, I'm going to say this really quick, but there's going to be a couple of things that are really primarily that stand in the way of transformation. And the first one is this, is religious culture will stand in the way. Notice that as this man is healed, the religious show up and they don't even celebrate the man's healing. They're upset that he's carrying the mat on the Sabbath. Can I, can I just tell y'all that you know you're around a religious person when they care more about non-essential details than they do about what God is doing in the life of a person? Can I tell you that religious people don't understand process? And, and sometimes it is a process. Sometimes people come into Gateway Church and they come into this place and they are still sick in infirmity. They come into this place, they're still sick in addiction. They come into this place, they're still confused in their identity. But the thing is this, as we love them where they are and we trust the Holy Spirit will meet them where they are, we love them enough to tell them the truth and tell them there's a better life and a better way for you than this. But we love you and we welcome you right here. And I have seen time after time after time when we love people correctly, we preach the gospel correctly, the Holy Spirit changes the lives of people in a way that we cannot do. But religious culture will always try to get in the way. This is what religious, this is how religious culture 
manifest in blocking us from transformation. There is one essential that I have to tell you that is necessary, absolutely at the heart for transformation, and it's humility. If, notice Jesus said, if we will humble ourselves, he'll exalt us. But if we exalt ourselves, he'll humble us. And, and what humility looks like is this, is, is religion will try to get you to put a mask on, to act like you have it all together, to act like you never have an issue. I remember some years ago, I had a kidney stone at a church and, and I, was, I was in a lot of pain and I was, I was grimacing and felt like I was going to pass. Anybody ever had a kidney stone? Like, I love y'all. Y'all are my people. Like, I, I'm sorry that happened to y'all. It is so painful. And I was about to pass out. And this lady comes up to me and she goes, hey. And I go, yeah. She goes, you only have that kidney stone because you don't have faith for it to be healed. I was medicated. I could have got away with a lot and blamed the medication, but I was like, what? So, so this is what we do. Somebody that's in pain, we go up to them and put shame on them to say it's their fault. And, and her husband made the comment. He said, I'm 68 years old and I haven't even had so much as a cold for the last two decades. I'm thinking, bro, Two weeks ago, you were in here burning up with fever, coughing under your breath, your eyes watering, and we ask if you need anything, you say, I'm fine. Like, can I tell y'all we need to get rid of that kind of faith? Like, like, this is the thing, Romans 4 says this, call the things that are not as though they are. It doesn't say call the things that are as though they're not. It's not sticking our head in the sand. So it's like, it's like you can say, I'm not sick. But if you're sick, you're sick. But just say, yes, I'm sick. But I also believe that by his stripes, I am healed. And the Lord is bringing me out of this. Don't ignore it. In Colorado, about 10, 15 years ago, there was a, a big legal case. Because these people went into a church and they, they had prayer. And their, their daughter was diabetic. And they declared and decreed her healing. And they went home and didn't give her any of her medicine, and she died. And I just, want, I just want to say this, like, first of all, it's very personal, like what God tells you to do and all of that kind of stuff, but, but can we just stop shaming people with a, the faith culture that says you have to act like nothing is wrong? That's what religion does, is it creates a posture of pride. And that posture of pride is a barrier to real healing and wholeness. And if we have a church where we're always posturing and we always got it together, like we will never have a place that's safe to be open and honest. We'll never have a place that we can say, hey, I'm struggling with porn. We'll never have a place that says, hey, I I'm struggling. I I've, I'm financially like in, in ruins and I need help. I need God to break in. Instead, we're always trying to act like we got it together. I just want to tell you, you don't have anything to prove. We are brothers. We are sisters. We are family. We love each other. We support each other. We pray for each other. And you don't have to ever impress me. All I want you to know is that you have a safe place to be honest about what you're facing and what you're going through so that you can find actual and real and total healing in Jesus' name. Can we give him praise for that today? The last one is this. That so, so, so humility is essential. So religious culture that promotes pride will stop you from becoming what God has called you to become. The second is this. Is sin. Sin. Now I want you to, I want you to get the totality of what I'm saying with this. Notice it tells, Jesus tells the man, go and sin no more lest something worse come upon you. And this is the thing is that I want us to understand this. Jesus dealt with our sin on the cross. So, so that means this, that when we put our faith in Jesus, all of our sin is forgiven. So, so sin, even though it is tangible, it is corrosive, it is destructive, and anything it touches, it's almost like acid. It just destroys and desecrates anything it touches. But the beautiful thing is because of the blood of Jesus, it washes away our sin and sin, not only has he delivered us from the wages of sin, which is death, but he has delivered us from the grip and the power of sin over our lives. Sin has no hold on you anymore. But this is the thing. Well, pastor, but I still sinned. 
And when you sin, you have an advocate with the Father. How many know Jesus in just kick back eating grapes in heaven? He is making intercession for us even right now. So, so right now, it's like, Jason, I saw you cut them off. And Father, forgive him. He knows not what he does when he cut them off in traffic. Like, like he is interceding for us and he's praying for us and he's yet forgiving us. Like, like he is our advocate. He's like our attorney that's fighting on our behalf. So, so you don't have to defend yourself. You have a defender. But this is the thing too. Just like we have a defender, we have a prosecutor. And the enemy is known in scripture as the accuser of the brethren. And I want you to hear me with this. Because sin has lost its grip on you because of Jesus, the only thing the enemy can do is try to shame you and condemn you into self-destruction. What he will do is he will, he will remind you of everything you've ever done and all the sins you've committed and all the mistakes you've made and the attitudes that you've had to get you to walk under a cloud of condemnation because he wants to confuse you in the cloud of condemnation because he wants to deceive you so that he can destroy you. But can I tell you that Jesus also silences the voice of the accuser. You have, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're grateful that your sins have been completely washed away, can you give him praise in the house this morning? Would you go ahead and stand to your feet this morning? Can you just, just bow your heads for a moment? This is a moment for that humility to kick in. If you say this morning, Pastor Jason, I want the Lord to help me change my settings. There are some things that are hardwired on me on the inside that, that hold me back from being everything God has called me to be. And I'm asking the Lord to help me change it. Maybe there's wounds and there's hurts and there's disappointment and there's shame and there's guilt and there's condemnation, whatever. But you're saying, God, I give it to you and I'm asking for your help. I won't embarrass you, but if that's you, would you just raise your hand right now and say, Lord, help me change my settings. Help me change my heart. My hands are up, guys. I'm asking the Lord to continue to work on my heart. Listen, I'm gonna confess this to y'all. It's really hard for me to trust people. And, and when I try to, it's, it's so hard because it's like I'm almost preparing my heart to be hurt because I've been hurt so much. It's a challenge. But you have to just take that to the Lord and say, God, this is what I struggle with. Help me. He'll meet you right in the midst of that. My second question is this. If you'd say, Pastor Jason, I don't know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And today's the day. I know the Lord brought me here for this moment that I want to be saved. I want everlasting life. I want to know Jesus, not just dead religion. I want everlasting life with him. Or maybe you say, I've known him, but I've just grown so distant from him. I just want to come home and be restored. If you want to be saved or you want to be restored, now's your moment. Would you just throw your hand up right now and say, Lord, that's me. Thank you, young man. Somebody else. I want to thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Come on, family, can we praise God for every hand that just went up? I'm gonna say a prayer for you. When I say amen, if you need to go, you can go. Our, our prayer with you, I ask you to say it with me. But when I say amen, if you need to go, you can go. If you wanna stay in worship, stay in worship. If you wanna to come to the altar, we would love to pray with you. And just, maybe there's something you need to come and just pour your heart out and say, I need prayer. Like this is a place we love you. It's a safe place to do that. Would you say this prayer with me? Say, King Jesus, please forgive me of all my sins. I confess you as Lord. I will follow you all the days of my life. My faith is in you, Lord. Today, change my settings. Make me like you. Let me humble myself that you can exalt me, that you can make me like you. Help me, Jesus, to bear fruit of your spirit. Heal my heart. Make me whole in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. Let's give him praise. I love you all so very much. God bless you.
So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I know it's not much. I've nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a for a heart singing hallelujah hallelujah all oh, my words fall short I've got nothing new how could I As I often do, but every song must stand, but you never do. So I. 